Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, think, I think we might be live. <laughs> just just a little um, uh, bleep moment here on my side. Greg told me to go live and I just kind of sat here. <laughs> so here we are. Here we are hollering in the house. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in once again to your Through the Veil live show. The day is Tuesday, November 8th. Um, hey, Greg, I don't even know if I had a chance to tell you this. Did you hear that we are now number one in Coldwater Canyon, California? We are? We are. Yeah, that was a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> Cold water in the house. Thank you, California, for tuning in and uh, making us number one in in your homes there we certainly appreciate it um we're working on getting number one in, in southern california my brother is from uh, yorba linda so we're working on those numbers he's from where yorba linda yorba linda yeah you're, um yorba linda is actually where um i think gerald ford was born it's a very pretty Yorba Linda. Yorba, Yorba Linda. Yorba. Yeah. Yorba Linda. Yes, it's uh, south of Long Beach, near near the water. You know, very pretty. Lots of horses and canyon homes and stuff like that. Nice. Yorba Linda. It sounds like something that fat kid from, or not that fat kid, <laughs> that one kid from Fat Albert would say. <laughs> Yorba Linda, Yorba baby. Linda. <laughs> need a ski mask pulled down. I loved, I loved Fat Albert. <laughs> well, we that have... Maybe watch it. I loved it. I thought it was great. You might notice uh. that um, we are shy, our guest, this week. We announced last week that our guest, Marie D. Jones, was going to be joining us tonight. And unfortunately, she had some things come up at the last second and was not able to join us. So we had to switch things up a little and... Uh, just bring you us and we know that you're so happy and excited about that right <laughs> yeah she had some personal things that came up at the last minute <clears throat> she uh she was really sad that she couldn't make it for this evening but she did say that uh, when we do get her on here in the very near future that she will have uh, a few surprises for uh, a couple of people so we're, we're, we're looking forward for that and we're looking forward of course for her to be on the show so it should be good yeah, we should tell him, and she's going to um, just be, because she feels so guilty, not that that was anything that we may have possibly said or done to make her feel that way, but <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's going to, um, you know, be giving away a couple books, and so we'll run a little contest during that show, so you have to pay real close attention, and near the end, we'll ask a couple questions about things that we covered in, in the hour previous, and, you know, first person answer kind of thing, we'll, we'll get one of her books i don't know um which one uh destiny versus choice is i think that's the title um as i'm looking because i have all their books and i don't um i don't see it right there so uh i, th I think it's destiny versus choice and actually did you know this greg that my story is in that book which story is that um, my synchronicity with James Renfield and the Celestine Prophecy, that whole thing is in, in there. So it's kind of like, is it, really? was it fate, synchronicity, you know, what happens in the universe to line things up. So yeah, as a contributing, as a contributing writer in that. <laughs> as a contributing writer. I was. <laughs> I, I posted well, on so Facebook, cool. I like took a picture <laughs> of the insides of by Michelle Griffin post on Facebook and then I remember to go oh I probably ought to promote the book too <laughs> I was so happy <laughs> nice oh wow well. so instead tonight we're gonna um, actually kind of talk with me and Greg's gonna interview me and we're gonna get get to know me better and you not too long ago Stacy Jones and I did did that where um she interviewed me, but we had such a goofy, fun time with it. I don't think that there was much serious that happened during that hour. And what's the difference that's going to be tonight? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we're going to wing it, yeah. and we're going to see how it goes. Like I'm not goofy. 
You look up Goofy in the dictionary, you see my face. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I am the goofiest person in the world. At least the goofiest person you know. Even my wife says, oh my god. Oh, I'm I'm looking over there in the in the chat room and recognizing some names. Um, says Jess is in the house, and of course Lawanda, mm -hmm. our uh, oh, our you even personnel. Got I know, what I saw talk? that. I'm like the true Mooney. Uh oh, uh oh, and Brandon, he's he's in there trying to misbehave and stuff, but he's not going to do that. He's not going to misbehave. <laughs> Not uh, gonna miss I'm not even going to go there. I'm at so least, glad to see, right see uh, Chris, Chris Moon in the house. Just that he's been, I know he's been on a tour and all over the place, and we haven't been able to talk and chat, catch up in a little while. Um, but I did get he's been text. quite busy. I know. I know. He's been all over the place. But I think he just got back like today or yesterday or something like that. And I know I haven't answered the text. See? Right there. I'm back from my crazy tour. You can't see that, but anyway. All if right. Is, if, if I'm not mistaken, he's been driving to uh, all the locations that he's going to on this tour. I don't know if uh, you've ever had the pleasure of either riding with Chris Moon. I haven't, but I've seen him drive. I've seen him drive up to uh, to location that he was meeting us at, and my God, his mother <laughs> nine times out of ten rides with him. She has to take Xanax. I'm sure she, you know, she's got the handle on here, she's got the seatbelt on. He's, he's just rolling. I, I have I have ridden with Chris, but I've always been the driver. But that's not because I knew anything about his uh, driving abilities. That's just my, I'm a control freak and a car sick person. So I, excuse me, I totally just burped right in the thing, Rupert. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I couldn't hide it. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be a classy that's night. The, that's the important thing. It's going to be a classy night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, so yeah. let's start All off. Right. Let, me, let me start off. Uh, last week, you know, we had Larry on, and Larry did talk a little bit about the Mayan calendar, and uh, I think we had asked him if he thought anything special was going to take place for this coming Friday, which is 11-11. So I have to ask you. What are your thoughts as far as uh, this coming Friday being 11-11? Do you think anything special or out of the ordinary is going to happen on that day? Well, I mean, and as you know, I will be in Orlando with your lovely bride and four of our other girlfriends to go spend the weekend um, with Panache Desai at an event there, um, kind of based mm -hmm. on eleven eleven, and you know, had an opportunity to go see him last month, October. And somebody said, "Well, why don't you just go then?" It's because it's not eleven eleven. Um, I don't really know for sure what's going to happen there. I just my idea is that. Um, when 11.11 comes, that there will be nothing recognizable, nothing, no um, angels in the sky, no big trumpet sounding, heralding in 11.11 a.m. on 11.11.11. We're just not going to notice anything. But I think that same thing with the Mayan calendar on December 21st, 2012. I think we're just moving into a new era, a new time, a new way of thought, a new group mm -hmm. consciousness. And you remember kind of that, that hippie movement. And we've been through, you know, the age of Aquarius. You know, we've been through all of these different kind of phases. And I think that that's basically what we're doing now is moving into a new phase where people are going to become more insightful. And 11-11, you know, seeing it on the clocks and all that kind of stuff, I think in a sense that it's, it's activating, it's causing us to be more aware, pay closer attention, and we're just moving into a new time. So we'll see. Okay. I'll, I'll call so, you if anything, my horns pop out. <laughs> like mine don't all the time. So do you think that uh, people that are already somewhat spiritually aware are going to be able to see the difference? And then people who are kind of on the fence maybe uh, will see things a little bit more spiritually? I'd, I don't think they're going to feel anything outright. You know, and, you know, um, and we've talked about this before, when the um, geomagnetic field or whatever is high, a lot of us will experience headaches and, and stuff like that, and they seem to kind of last mm -hmm. for several days, and then they just, 
fade away. So there might be something like that that we experience some physical symptoms or you know something, but nothing that we're going to be able to say, oh look, this this is what caused it. Okay, so then that kind of leads me to uh, next year for the big one, the the twelve twenty one of two thousand and twelve. Do you think uh, there's going to be anything significant that's going to really happen on that day? No. Same thing? <laughs> Say the same so, thing. You know, like Larry was saying. Larry was saying that, uh, you know, the, his his way of, of uh, warning it, it was uh, the Mayans basically just ran out of room. They constructed the calendar. They constructed the calendar to go from, uh, from beginning to end. Of, it was going to last 25,000 years. You know, I kind of... I, I kind of agree with that, but I I don't agree with it fully. Right. For one, it's kind of hard for me to, to think that any group of people would make a 25,000-year calendar. Right. I mean, come on. Right. Do you not have anything better to do than make a 25,000-year calendar? I think it, it shows something. It's got to show something of, of what's, what's going to come. Right. The, I think actually that it's it's showing the uh, the procession like i had said uh, a few months ago it's going to show the procession of when it's going to basically go back to uh, to the end of it to the beginning and the end and the procession is nothing more than just the you know there i'm not going to do the strange twirling thing which i'm doing right now yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think that's all it is i don't think it's anything major well i think the mayans were cyclic people you know, and for whatever reason, they chose 25,000 years. I, I think that that was for a reason. Um, but And Chris Moon might remember this. Back when I was part of the Haunted Times radio, we interviewed um, a guy who had written about 2012 and stuff. And he felt like he was, you know, really knowledgeable. And I remember listening to him and saying, well, the Mayans were right in their prophecies and their predictions about a lot of things. They mm -hmm. predicted that one day we would be drinking glass from a water, from a cup. Drinking water from a cup, sorry. <laughs> right. And I remember sitting there thinking, well, wasn't that out of necessity? That's not a big prediction. That's having to walk down to a stream, scoop water up in your hands. By the time you got back up to your little place you're living, you didn't have any left. And you're thinking, geez, I, I wish... I had something to hold this in, you know, then it went to a rock with a little divot in it, and, you know, so it was that kind of necessity thinking, so it wasn't any big thing that, you know, they didn't say a glass, and then uh, he talked about how they knew the importance of the stars and the astrological signs and all this, and I thought, but what else was there to do at night? You know, right. you laid there and you looked at the stars, you know? Right. Oh, what else do we do? <laughs> Right, and oh, they saw we them. Oh, wait, we got another 20,000 years ago for that. <laughs> right. Uh, right, they could know? see that things were moving, so they made some certain assumptions about, you know, why this was here in the cold months and this was over, these stars were over here in the hot months, and, you know, they didn't have a lot going on <laughs> to take up their right. time, but to, but to sit there and think about it. So, I, I don't know. I mean, smart, smart people, obviously, but... Um, We'll, we'll see. I just think we're entering a new phase. And we'll, we'll see what happens. See, yeah, basically once we... Uh, once I do we think it's interesting, though, that the winter solstice on December 21st, it ha occurs on December 21st, 2012, the date, at 11, 11 a.m. <laughs> oh, no way. I, I, I swear to God. Before. Yeah, I only found that out um, a couple of <laughs> couple of years ago or something. I was reading about it, and I thought, oh, my God, they have a time even set for it, for the winter solstice. It wasn't in, it was, it was like with Wikipedia or something. It wasn't in conjunction with a big prediction or prophecy site. It was just talking about winter solstice, naming off the year, the, you know, days, times, and all that. I'm like, holy crap. Well, but it's not going to be I've an never apocalypse. Heard that I'm going to have to actually look into that and see what uh, what I can pull up. Yeah, yeah, and you'll you'll find out. I'm right. I'm right. 11 11 a.m. December 21st, 2012 is the winter solstice. But yeah, so we'll see. You know what I always used to say? I always used to say that uh, that's going to be the date and time that all the aliens that don't know that they're really aliens are going to actually turn and, and take over the world. 
So everybody who is uh, not, uh, you know, the, uh, the right blood type, you know, like I'm O positive, which means I'm from here. But other yeah, people you're that gone. are like negative blood, you know, they're, the, they're really the hidden aliens. They're going to come out on that time, and they're just going to take over. By the way, Michelle, what's your <laughs> blood type? Oh, go crap. Here we go. You're gonna. Th- your your goal is to make sure that all of the crazy things that I think I have to say publicly. I don't care. So here's the deal. <laughs> okay. Now, in order for and and Christmas, it's, it's just perfect that Chris is here tonight. Um, in order for things to stand out to me as important to catch my attention, I think the universe knows that it has to be big. You know, it has to be like, oh crap. So one day, um, girlfriend Rebecca and I picked up Chris Moon, and we went to lunch. Now, we're sitting, the three of us, at this table, and she's talking about something that she um, had just read. And we were talking about how I think it's like 6 or 16% of the population have are RH negative. Um, whatever blood type, whatever your letter, the letter is your blood type, the positive or negative is your RH factor, whether or not you have have RH or not. Um, Only 16% of the population are RH negative. I'm like, wow. And I said, I'm A negative. Rebecca goes, I'm O negative. And I think Chris was also O negative or something like, ooh, you know, what are are the chances of that, that 16, you know, three of those 16% (laughs) of the entire, entire population are sitting here at this table? And so she went on to talk about the theory that, um, and the fact that there is no known medical reason to be RH negative. Blood um, duplicates itself so perfectly, there's no reason. And if you read about RH negative, what it says is that it is a mutation of unknown origin. Mm -hmm. You know, as advanced as we are medically, we don't know. Nobody knows. How, how did that happen? You know, and we are also the only species that if, the, if as, an, a, as a negative mother, if I'm carrying a positive child, if I don't get a certain shot, my body will fight the body of my infant. The only, right. <laughs> only species to, to do that. You know, so right. something's odd. So the theory is that back in the day, the ancient astronauts, the aliens, the whatever you want to call them, um, and in the, in the Bible, there's some references to, to other gods, you know, coming and, and mating with the women of the earth or whatever. So the theory is that if you have negative blood, that you are part um, alien, crossbred, you know, descendant of an alien or um, reptilian or something like that, shapeshifters, just not, not fully human. And then there's other, there's other characteristics, if you really go into it, that negative people um, have an extra, <laughs> this is so weird, an extra bone on their spine, like the leftover of a tail, you know, beyond, oh. beyond what yep. the normal people have in their tail bone, there's an extra thing there. Um, typically blue or green eyed um i'm green eyed hazel eyed um cold i'm always cold you know um and a higher incidence of don't go there greg a higher incidence of uh, psychic abilities and, and things like that amongst those who are negative so i posted a poll on facebook one day i'm like okay tell me and just said are you is your rh factor positive or negative. And I figured that about 16% of my sample poll would be negative and the rest of them would be positive. And it was overwhelmingly negative. And I was like, you know, like, wait a minute, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense. We're only 16% of the population. But then I realized that my sample population is in um, a field of people who are involved in (laughs) metaphysical, paranormal. So um, I, it would be really interesting to do a poll with all of the people involved in this field and the, you know, the little outcrops of it to see what's the percentage of those people who are negative. <laughs> it would be cool. There. But my my crazy is showing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. 
let's 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 uh, change it a little bit. Uh, speaking of you being in the paranormal field, I know you've been uh, around for what a good uh, eight, nine, maybe even ten years doing yeah. the paranormal. Yeah, ten years. Okay. And then, and then you you know some somewhere on the line you started to to kind of delve into the the metaphysical side as well. Those who don't know you uh, have said, if I'm not mistaken, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, that you became suddenly psychic after you basically got to know Chip. I got to ask, what's your reaction to, to hearing something like that, or hearing somebody say that about you? Well, first of all, it's, it's bullshit. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, I, I did not, when when I got involved in the paranormal field, and if you really know me, you know that I love the research side of it. Um, I love to create experiments to think of, you know, how we can either prove something or debunk something. You know, I like to use that side of my brain. So when I got involved mm -hmm. in the paranormal, I was all about that, and I was not thinking or concerned with any of these experiences that I had had as a child. I wasn't having them right then. But as I started to go out and do investigations, I would just get sort of certain feelings about areas that we would be able to kind of back up. But I still wasn't talking about it because I had sort of created um, a reputation of being a serious female investigator. And, right. I mean... Let's face it, there's not a whole lot of those out there that, you know, that it's just not... Serious right. investigators or serious female Con investigators? Considered. There's not a lot of female investigators who are considered serious. You know, they may be quite serious, you know, but they're not considered that way. And it's just, just the way it is. So... Why would you say that? Um, there's obviously a lot of female investigators out there, but why would you say that they're not taken seriously? Um, because the majority of investigators are female, the majority of people leading the groups are not. So that tells me that the women are either not allowed to or not stepping up into leadership roles. Okay. Okay. I see so, what you're saying now. So, here I was, you know, trying to do the best I could, and I was very passionate about it, felt like I found my niche, this is it, my life purpose. And, but I was having these other experiences, and I started to kind of lead um, a double life, if you will. You know, I was out doing the paranormal thing, but on the side, I was looking into my experiences that I had before, and um, was more interest, becoming more interested in that part of me. And so I had to come to a point where I had to say, all right, this, this is, you know, what I'm picking up on, and started to confess to people. The first person, um, the first group leader, whatever, that I did a reading for was actually Patrick Burns from um, Ghost Hounds from Haunting Evidence. And I knew him prior. This is prior to any of the shows, any of that kind of stuff. He was the first one that I did a reading for. His brother came through, blah, blah, blah. But I was not, you know, trying to be... A psychic that wasn't who I wanted to be because that you can't prove that it went against my whole left brain you know I questioned everything maybe I picked up on his body language blah 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 but you know meet, meeting Chip I would definitely he supported me but that has mm -hmm. nothing to do with I didn't suddenly come out of the psychic closet when I met Chip yeah you know, okay. not not true so, I so you know what's your you know, I wouldn't say what's your reaction, but I mean I don't understand why people would say that you suddenly became psychic after you got to know Chip. And you've you've known Chip for actually I mean for the amount of years that you've been in the paranormal, you've only known Chip for what about five? Probably five or six, but you know def definitely before the shows. You know, we became friends before the shows. You know, I helped him put together his first little um, conference, same with Patrick Burns, but helped them put together their first conferences, both of them separately, of course, in um, Savannah. You know, but, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> because I'm female, if I have anything to say or I do anything, it's, it, it's attached to, because I'm fortunate enough to know some people who have, you know, made, made their way you know, whatever, been recognized by the by the public for, for what they do. You know, if I 
had a dollar for every time that I've said something publicly and was told that I'm just speaking on behalf of Chip, just speaking on behalf of Chris Moon, just speaking on behalf of, of um, oh, I don't know who else right now, but you know, I'm, I'm not taken as my own person. And I've, I've known all of these people. I knew Chris, too, before, you know, he was doing anything with any shows or anything. So, please. Yeah, I think it's a bunch of crap. Yeah, I think these are, you know, if you ask me, I'm going to come right out and say, I think these people are jealous. I think this it's just jealousy, plain and simple. You know, people, they, they are, I think a lot of people are actually jealous of you as far as, the, the people that you know and the knowledge that you have. And, you know, you have to say that you have a ample bounty of both. Um, and it's just, I think it's a shame that people would be jealous of you for those two reasons. But I think that's the, I think that's the case. Uh, well, it's just a way of never um, answering any question that I might pose to somebody else. Because if you just say, ah, not going to listen to you. You're speaking on behalf of Moon. You're speaking on behalf of Coffee. Let them speak for themselves. They just never have to answer anything I say. So, Speaking of Moon, another question for you. Yeah, I know that you have a Frank's box. As we've been on a few investigations, I've used it, and I've had some really cool results. But uh, I never, never did get a chance to ask you, how did you come to the ownership of getting a Frank's box? Did you actually... Talk to Frank and, you know, uh, what's his last name, Sumption? Yes, Sumption. Did you actually talk to Frank Sumption and he actually uh, sent you a box that he had made? Or did you, you know, was it uh, from a friend of Frank's or anything like that? And it, um, specifically from Frank Sumption, made specifically for me. But, um, you know, I had, I had known of Frank via, you know, hearing Chris Moon's story and how, you know, he came to be um, in possession of the Frank's box and the work that he was doing and was members on different boards and stuff was really interested in um, the ideas behind how it worked and I got the schematics mm -hmm. and I looked at them and in fact I've got them right I pull them out right now I've got the Frank's box schematics <laughs> right in front of me but um, I couldn't you know like I don't know what the <laughs> what the, <laughs> I just right. didn't know so um, you know and, and Frank is is um, a good good guy. I think that I can safely say that he is eccentric, and you know can be um, emotional. You know sometimes and gets frustrated with things, and you know he he reacts. And so we didn't always see eye to eye. <laughs> um, in fact, typically didn't at all. Um, but some time had passed, and I had asked him about something else, and we had started to chat a little bit. And I asked if he would consider, I thought, you know, heck with it, I'm just going to ask him. And so I asked if he would consider it, and um, he was thinking about it when he was messing with another box and sent me a recording that said, um, you, um, you do have time for the Babs box. And my nickname, <laughs> based on Babby R's, my, my ex-husband's name, had become Babs. So you do have time for the Babs box, and he built it for me and sent it. No, I mean, people still call me Babs, and, um, you know, people have known me for a while still call me Babs, and I know other people go, who, who are they talking to? <laughs> <laughs> right. <coughs> yeah, so, so that's what um, I did was I was able to, to get that. I don't work with it as extensively as somebody like Chris Moon, so I haven't developed, because um, I, I do think you develop a relationship with it and with the um, people on the other side that you're, you're working with. Um, I, can, I can believe that. I can tell when, when, and I, I call it something different than probably Chris does, but I, I call it when, um, when I'm in. When something happens, you know, because sometimes there's just nothing going on. There's no communication. It's just radio, and I can, I can feel it's like a lack of, um, but when we start like a lack of, of a, a spiritual connection in a way yeah just kind of like um free for all it feels kind of chaotic in my head um but when when right prior to communication starting when i will really like oh it's time to listen i'll feel the only thing i can describe it as is like a downshift um it's like literally the energy downshifts and you know slows me way down and i can mm -hmm. feel it and then i'll i'll start really paying it paying attention to it. I they can drink understand the things that you're getting. Yeah, yeah most, I, I, most of the time. 
I've sat there and listened to it, and there, there have been times where I've seen you and Luanda, you know, basically doing the session, and I would, I would be filming you guys, and you guys would hear a word come out of the box. You two would totally understand what the word was, and you would say it out loud at the same time. And I would be just sitting there going, I didn't even hear that at all. I, mean, I think it's just a matter of being able to connect with the box. Uh, and as you just said, I think that uh, some, sometimes you can connect quite easily, and other times that you, you know, you're not really in sync. There have been times when I've messed around with my hack shack, and I've had a good connection, and I've had good responses. And other times where, just you know, no, I'm not hearing it today. It's it's just not the way it should be. Or right. you know, I'm just, I'm not hearing anything out of right. this thing really. Yeah, and like, it's this, definitely this, the same box. thing. And it, it takes a lot of um, practice in, in listening to it. And you probably remember when you first started to record EVP. And, you know, what would we do? We'd have to turn off the TV, no distractions, big old fat fuzzy headphones <laughs> on, looking, you know, staring at nothing. You could not be on the computer. And you're like, oh, I think, I think, you know, now... Somebody can, you know, I can play the recorder driving in the car with my radio on and window down a little bit. I'm like, oh, there's one. <laughs> you know, right. you, you tune into it and you know, you learn to recognize it. And with the with the Frank's box, it's it's certainly um, difficult just because there's so much other noise going on. You have to learn to to hear beyond it or hear behind it, basically. Right. I mean, I think they all work to uh, to a degree, to, you know, almost depending upon the person that's using it. But uh, I think the, uh, and, you know, whether you're using the Frank's box or the Hack Shack or even the, I think there's another box called the, the Joe's box. And I think they all are viable options of, of a ghost box. But I think it does depend on the, uh, the person who's actually sitting there and using it. And it may be kind of like uh, using the, uh, the old Ouija board. You know, some people can use a Ouija board. Other people, that doesn't really react to them. It could be right. the same case. I, you know, I'm no pro when it comes to that, so I can't quite say. Let me ask you another question, uh, kind of going back a little bit. Um, okay. Let's talk about your abilities and how you came to know them. Okay, well, um, I think that I was kind of set up to... Um, be gifted in certain ways that I am and part part of that is growing up the way that I did and my um, house was not a um, not a good household to grow up in there was sexual abuse going on physical abuse alcoholism mm. um, all kinds of stuff happening all the time so when you live in a situation like that and you can relate to it even if it's not not to the extreme but um, when you argue or somebody else is arguing that tension that you feel in the air when you're living in a household like that. One second. <laughs> Stop. I okay. Know, Dakota just barked a second ago. When you're living in a household like that and you're a child, you have to learn real quick how to read people, read the energy, feel what's going on. Is this the right time to come out of my room? Should I not come out? Should I stay gone? You know, I got really good at reading the energy in the household. Um, didn't always help, but <laughs> I knew what was coming. So then to to go on, probably the first, the first psychic experience I had, and although I didn't know that then, well, some of the first experiences I had were astral travel. I was leaving my body during certain situations that were, were happening. Um, some people might say that, no, that was a, f a fugue state. That was a psychological thing that happened to cause you to, to leave your body. But I was actually going through um, a process that is the same as I've heard explained by people who have a near-death experience. So I don't mm. think it was fugue. I would, I would hear a very loud buzzing in my ears. Um, I would see a pinpoint of white light that would come closer and closer and closer to it filled up my vision, then go back again, pinpoint back and forth, and it would cycle like that until I was just gone. So um, those were the first psychic experiences, the first kind of voice that I heard, although it, it sounded like my voice, was um, uh -huh. when I was running away. I was 11 years old and was 
running and I thought that my mother was coming drunk in the car to track me down and so I'd hid behind a car because headlights were coming so I was hiding and while I was crouched down and in my heart just boom 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 um, I heard uh, something like everything's gonna be fine really you know and right then I didn't you know I didn't really think I didn't have the skills to really think that through but you know looking back on it there's no reason why I should have had that thought because there was nothing going on in my life that told me everything was going to be a-okay you know I, sh- I my waking thoughts were not good you know so no I, I have to ask you uh, real quick when when you heard that did you hear that you know was that your own mind you think I mean did you hear that in your own mind's voice or did, it, did you actually hear a voice within your head that said hey everything is going to be fine I I hear things it, with that sound like my own voice that sound like my own thought um, but the only reason why I know it's not is because when it says things number one that I wouldn't say or in a way that I wouldn't say something okay because, you know, once again, I you know, I think everybody has intuition. I think everybody's intuition can be uh, at a certain degree, basically. And, you know, for, for most part, I've had intuition that said, hey, don't go down that road or, you know, don't uh, cut this person off in the, on the highway or, hey, be careful here, be careful there. But, you know, I, I just call that my in- intuition. A lot of people, you know, if you're a police officer, say it's your gut feeling. Right. But it seems that you actually were able to really accept your intuition to push yourself farther to become really uh, more psychic, to actually have an actual connection. Uh, And that's another question I should ask you. So when you are now basically more psychic, how how do you get your information from the other side? Do you get it like in the form of visual pictures or, or visions basically that come into your, your head your head or your mind or do you actually hear a voice you know mm-hmm. that's you know, like a disembodied voice that gives you a message um i don't hear voices other than my own um usually it i mean it seems like just my own thought but it's just in the way that it comes you know um the the quickness of it if i'm doing uh a reading or um, just a, a feeling that I get that this this is what I'm supposed to say that although it sounds like me um, but yeah. I didn't I didn't really trust I mean I just had more experiences that I knew something is going on you know my grandmother passed when I was um, uh, 16 and I was in Kansas she was in California at the moment of her death I did not know that she was dying um, at the moment of her death, I had all this flood of thoughts of her run through my head. I was in the shower getting ready to go to work. And I I blew that off as saying, well, she must have, you know, because I had heard that when you die, your life passes before your eyes. So I thought, oh, must be that she was living, going through that and passed by the memories of me and that that kind of reached out to me. So I didn't think that had anything to do with me. That was her um, another another time I was really, really angry, uh, having a fight with a, a boyfriend, hung up on him and threw the phone across the room, and as the phone left my hand, I saw um, blue streaks of energy shooting out my fingers. So they were things, things that scared me, um, mm-hmm. had precognitive, so. yeah, precognitive <laughs> dream of desert storm and the, and the tracer lights shooting up from the ground, um, only to see it on TV six months later and be like, oh, you know. So I knew that. I mean, there were significant enough experiences where they stayed in the back of my mind as I should really consider <laughs> thinking about what what that is that's happening. And then it was just trust after that. Okay. So, I, you know, when you said that you, you saw a desert storm a- happening six months before it started, was did it come to you in a vision or did it come to you as far as in a dream? That was that was a dream. Um, dreamt that I was um, on some grass and it was nighttime and the horizon was rounded. So I knew that that was like the earth, the world. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. saw those lights shooting up from the horizon and I'd never seen anything like that. And as that was happening, the world started spinning 
and you know weird things and dreams but I was holding on to blades of grass to to prevent myself from being flung off so I knew and I woke up you know heart pounding I thought end of the world is what it felt like so later six months later when I come home and turn on the news to see that happening on a desert storm you know I thought oh crap I in my dream that was the end of the world so this must also be the end of the world shut off the TV and that's it done I bet. Yeah. Um, I got I got another question for you. Actually, this this question comes from out of chat, and I have to screw it over because I've been watching chat on my uh, system tonight. I think the question came from uh, oh our illustrious illustrious leader Brandon. Brandon uh, had the question. Um, uh, what was the most scariest moment that uh, either you or uh, with your gift? while being on an investigation. I have a question. What What's the most scariest moment for her, either with her gift or while being an investigator? So, the scariest moment that you've had, uh, I guess as far as once you, you started in the paranormal field, what, was the scariest moment linked to you being an investigator or with when, uh, in using your gift as being a psychic? Um... I haven't really been scared. I've been startled at things that have happened, you know, loud, um, uh, the Waverly Sanatorium hearing a really, really loud bang just several feet from me. Um, that was definitely startling. And, you know, I did not continue to hang out in the room <laughs> for very much longer after that. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it definitely startled me. But, um Probably the, the scariest, and not scary in the way that you would think, is when um, somebody had started contacting me because her daughter had been murdered. And she was asking for my help psychically. And we were, we would just chat by email. And I started to get information. And I remember that I had sent her one email, and I was, you know, getting ready to hit send. And um, this name popped into my head and I'm trying to trying to think of it I can't think of it now but it's not a name that I had ever heard of before and okay. um, so I you know quickly put in PS um, I just heard this name you know I don't know if it means anything and it turns out that that name was the name of a guy who they had looked at um, that he'd been murdering women in New York City but that he was apparently in jail when her daughter was murdered and he couldn't have done it and I thought well there has to be for me Draymond that was his name Draymond D-R-A-Y-M-O-N-D Draymond okay and th I still never heard that name again since you know um and so I thought well there's got to be a connection and so I was trying to like describe it and I said there's something about his eyes or something like he looks really tired or something and she said that his girlfriend had been picked up for assisting him in the murders and she was known as a um, sleepy-eyed hooker you know so I was getting this information but it wasn't coming together because he didn't do he couldn't have done it he was in jail but she wasn't and you know trying to and she was continuing Right, I don't... That's that's pretty scary. It, it was very scary because then I knew, okay, that so I'm getting information here, but we're not talking about, is there a ghost in Mr. Smith's house? We're talking about somebody's daughter, you know, and so that, that was scary, and I, I do remember that I called Chip on that one, and I was crying, and I said, I don't know what to do. I To think that I might potentially say something that would cause this mother more pain was overwhelming yeah. overwhelming but you know from that information um they did find out that uh, uh well i don't know if they found out directly from you from what you had said but i think it, it from what lawana was just looking up i think they did find out that the girl did commit more murders after uh, the and they have proof and, and what there was an actual trial after all that was she found guilty Yeah. Oh, that's I yeah. got the chills again. Draymond Coleman. And, even, the, and the guy looks scary. 
And, and the name, the name, Greg, is tattooed. Draymond is tattooed on the back of his neck. <sighs> uh, so, but I mean, what and what was really more bizarre, and I think what kind of I parted ways with that, um, with that mother because I think she felt like she was going to get some more help. Because remember that, um, oh, I can't think of her name. Remember that psychic. Um, challenge thing they had on TV and that Michelle White Dove won but there was that other person Jackie Barnett something something like that um, dark haired girl looked really dark didn't want anybody touching her she was really kind of scary you know um, she ended up doing some sort of TV spot special after that and that that person's case was featured mm -hmm. on there and Jackie, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think we just haven't we haven't spoken in in years now. But that was that was very scary for me, and I never. I, I want to help. My heart aches for things like that. I would love to get involved in you know um, forensic psychic work and you know help that kind of stuff. But it's it's heavy, and for you know people who think oh these psychics who are working these cases are ambulance chasers whatever. If they're serious, and they're, I'm sure that there are those, but if they're serious about what they're doing, that that's a tough burden to carry. Tough. Right. Because hey, from what I understand, I mean, a lot of psychics that actually delve into that that part of the field, forensic science, you know, they, for the most part, actually see or get a vision of how the person was killed. I don't know if it's if it's uh, they actually see it or if it's a fact that uh, they actually feel the energy or the uh, the negative act of being killed. Either case, or you know, either either or, I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to go. Okay. Yeah, no, I, wow. I didn't see. I could not see anything like that. I would get bits and pieces. I mean, some psychics claim to um, channel, basically channel the murderer. Or channel the victim and experience things. I mean, what what I got was was little bits of information. I don't know if I would that I would have gotten more. Maybe if I could, you know, go go to the situ go to the place. But I knew her. Um, I knew her f feet were wet when she came in because I saw a quick image of her shoes to the side and wet on the floor. And her mo her mom said it was raining that day. And I had a feeling that she was um, brushing her hair in the bathroom when somebody came knocking at the door, and she she went and let him in. But anyway, and see, you know that's that's the, the the most bizarre part of it. You know, you don't you know wake up going, hey, I think something bad's going to happen to me today, or I think you know I'm actually going to get killed today. You have no clue when you know the act actually comes upon you. It could be the person that's knocking on your door to say that they're delivering something to you and then they burst in and, and actually uh, have a gun and you know they do sick things to you but you know that's that's the unfortunate things that happen within our society but i think a lot of the people that actually come to psychics and say hey can you help me out with my daughter you know i think a large part of that is they're trying to come up with some form of closure you know they they're, they didn't have a chance to actually say you know that I love you, even though they may say it, you know, like every other day to this person. But I think it's a way of them finding closure and being able to, to give like that last hug that they weren't able to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I know um, Brandon's asking uh, something about uh, the the voices, and Chris did call it calming voices. Is there a way you can turn them off when they become overwhelming? And um, that that's not how um, it works with me you know I don't I'm not walking around getting information and hearing this and hearing that I I literally have to stop you know and, and maybe that's because my life is so freaking crazy busy that I don't hear it you know I have to I have to stop drop down in my gut or open up or whatever but in in the duration of my everyday life I'm not walking around open up ready for whatever Right. I mean, there are people that, that do. Um, I'm not sure if they can easily turn it off. I've heard people say that, oh, I can't turn it off, the voices. And I, re I refuse to go to places where there are lots of people because the voices that I get are just overwhelming. Yeah, I, I can, I, there's no way that I could do that. There's absolutely. 
But uh, I heard that there are some people that, that they do know how to kind of shut themselves down and they kind of are able to perform or I guess they're able to actually be somewhat uh, like everybody else. Right. Yeah, I have not met a single person really who um, walks around going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I hear this, I hear that, I see this, I see that. You know, thank, thank God because that, that's just not how I roll. <laughs> You know, right. that would be crazy. That's like floppy tuna psychic stuff, you know, falling out. and I don't know. That, that's not me. I got another one for you. Okay. Um, first, I, I, I got to ask our illustrious leader, how much time do we have? Because according to my time, we got uh, two minutes. I, I asked him what, in there if we could go over, and he said we could. Okay, good, good. Okay, here, here's a question I, I asked Chip once. Um you know, walking down the street or being out, you know, shopping, things of that nature, and, you know, just totally into shopping, picking up a bag of coffee, and then you happen to glance over at a woman who's, you know, in the same aisle, and then you get a vision that her child or somebody related to her is going to be in a serious accident. You know, what do you do in that case? Do you stop and say, hey, I know you don't know me, I don't know you, but... Uh, you need to watch your child and tell them that they can't go out this evening because they get seriously hurt. Do you actually have that conversation, or do you, you know, continue walking and not say anything? Um, I, I don't know because it hasn't happened to me, and I, I'll pick up more on the energy of the particular person, but I haven't been shown any future, you know, dangerous things coming up, but, um, not, not in that kind of thing, and I was in Palm Springs on my honeymoon and had this dream about a friend that I hadn't talked to in a long time. We were, we were friends on Facebook, but we hadn't actually talked in a while. We used to work together. And um, mm -hmm. I had this vision of um, his child falling out a second story window and, um, you know, bonk, dead on the ground. And I woke up, and it, I was just so overwhelmed by it. It felt like, and we've all had this experience, I'm sure, when you know when a dream is a dream, you know, mm -hmm. when you're wearing a fur coat and you step outside and turn into a cat who lives in a mailbox, you know, <laughs> weird stuff like that. You know it's a dream. But <laughs> right. when there's something more significant, you, you just have a gut feeling. There's something there. And so um, I debated for just about an hour, and I thought, okay, I got to... I, I couldn't call him and say, dude, what's, what's up with this? So, and I was casual back because I didn't want to frighten him, so I sent him a message on Facebook and said, okay, can you tell me why I'm seeing, um, uh, what did I say? Can you tell me why I'm, I might be seeing your kid falling out of a window? Didn't say I saw him dead, second story, blah, blah, blah. He wrote back right. later on that day, and said, well, gee, I don't, I don't know, but we did just get our second story windows replaced. Like, oh, okay, well, you might want to check them. So he went home that night from work, checked all the windows, and there was one stinking window, and I got the chills thinking about it. There was one window that was not, I don't know how you stick a window in so it doesn't fall out, but it was not secured. And when he just pushed on the base of it, it started to slide out. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and his kid, I'm sure his, his kid, you know, wasn't going to go up there and try to push the window. He could have said right. he's a little kid. Yeah. And he could have just leaned up against the exactly. window. Exactly. You know, exactly. To look down and, and then and, that would have been it. Yeah. Yeah. Dear God. Yeah. So did I did. I did make a, a, a judgment call to change the wording a little bit so it wouldn't be frightening to, to them, but put it, put it out there. You know, and as, as soon as he said, well, we just had our second story windows replaced. Okay, now I'm going to get a little bit more serious. Go check them, you know. Yeah, yeah, and it's a good thing you did say, you know, that to him or, you know, God forbid, you know, it could have something terrible could have happened. Yeah, yeah, he wrote so back and said, I'll never I... know if you saved a life or not, but thank you. you know, so. Right. And at least you had the opportunity to do so. Yeah. Not a lot of people who uh, who get visions like that actually act on it. Right. You know, how many people are out there that actually saw something terrible happen in, you know, as far as a vision, and then, uh, you know, a couple hours, uh, a couple of days, even a couple months later, that terrible act did occur, and they didn't say anything, you know, prior to that. But, you know, for the most part, you don't want to come across like you're crazy. 
Right. You know, you don't want to call your friend and, and make them worry either. Well, and what what could you do? You know, and, and many of the things, you know, so many people had um, visions and uneasy feelings and stuff like that directly prior to 9-11. You know, um, some people yeah. actually had dreams of something involving the towers. But what could they do? You know, what would happen, you know, if you call up and, oh, dude, you know, I think you know, blah, blah, blah is going to happen to the towers. Well, somebody's going to come pick your butt up, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, but... But, but we do know, we do get a sense of it. I mean, there's these things called random number generators that are in different locations throughout the world. And the numbers are one and zero. And randomly, mm -hmm. there's a percentage of how many times ones and zeros should come up, obviously, 50-50, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And they just run. And the, the reason that they are there is to test if anything affects them and makes that percentage change. And prior to 9-11, they were affected um, at the prior to. So, so that should say something, something we knew, something instinctively, intuitively. I've heard that before about the uh, there's machines all over the world yeah. uh, that generate, uh, you know, I guess, binary code, just ones and zeros. But I didn't quite understand the link between a dramatic event and them being uh, or displaying something other than what they normally get. Uh, I well, and I don't think they fully get it either, but it's, a, it's some sort of act of collective consciousness or of us tapping in to something changes the waves or whatever and if affects those generators. I mean, the, and it's only when big things, um, ob the election of President Obama, they were affected um, at the news of Princess Diana's death. They were affected. Um, Michael Jackson, you know, some of the the events in time that moved us all, you know. Why would they be affected by the election of President Obama? You know, that it's was, like saying, oh, this is when it began. No, because he's, you know, <laughs> they're our first black president, dude. He's not, okay. Well, you know, let's go a little off. He's not black. He's only a little bit cream-colored. He's not actually a black guy. You can't go to Obama and go, hey, man, what's up? I'm sorry. I do not understand the slang that you are using. No, that's not true. He's not really black. Yes, he is. I saw I, I saw a video of him playing basketball, so I know he's black. <laughs> Even the one that goes, listen to you, you're not black. <laughs> yeah. I've got my black card somewhere. It's somewhere. You're, you're the whitest guy I don't around. I not that often, but I still have one. No, Pre President <laughs> President Obama enjoys playing a good game of basketball, so he's black. Because <laughs> he plays basketball. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, that oh, was, that was like huge. That's like commercial from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> no, I don't know. What do they say from that commercial? Um, ladies and gentlemen, watch out for your children. The Negroes are coming to town. <laughs> watch the crime rate go up. Watch the property levels go down. Watch the basketball team become unbeatable. Uh, <laughs> see? I told you. I told you. That's why I know. <laughs> oh, dear God. All but right, but something happens. And that, that will go into um, Jungian psychology of there being um, a collective consciousness that we all have the ability to tap into. And so that, that I think, is the link between... The, the number generators being affected, that somehow we are, are tapping into this universal thing that knows everything that was, is, and will be. And you know what that kind of reminds me of? It kind of reminds me of uh, animals out in the, in the woods, and they, they suddenly get that, that feeling, and you know, they look up, and then they just dart off. And you're right. like, well, that was kind of odd. You know, what what made it do that? I mean, did you make a noise? No. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, there you just have to be in the area that Mount St. Helens at, and two minutes later, it happens to erupt. You right. know, it make, makes you wonder. You know, did they you know that? You know, did they get an inkling somehow psychically that this was going to happen, or you know, was it the fact that they were able to feel the earth beneath their feet and go, oh, something terrible is going to happen? I kind of lean towards the fact that. They knew something, you know, it, it, psychically, basically, was about to occur. 
Right. It's kind of hard for me to say that they were, they were able to feel the, the ground shake beneath them and uh, go from there. Well, I think, I think they could sense the... Okay, for instance, we just did that investigation at um, Fox 5. When we went mm -hmm. into the sports bunker, the majority of us felt a shift as we entered that room. We were like, oh, crap. You know, and assume something, something's down here. But when we right. came back later to investigate it and started doing our baseline readings, we discovered that the EMF field was very high down there. Oh, yeah, it was. Okay, so, mm -hmm. but we sensed that. Physically could sense a, a change, and I felt it shift. Um, I think the animals are a lot um, more in tune to that kind of stuff. So they feel it and they react. And, you know, who, who says that we're the smarter species? You know, animals sense fear and they turn and hightail it. You know, right. we sense fear and we're like, <laughs> you know, we'll stick around. <laughs> Just stick around. Right. <laughs> right. And that's where we are. Right. Yeah, that's where we, we've become wired, you know, throughout the ages. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's just being being sensitive to that. We could learn a lot from our animals, which is you know why I, th I think it's kind of uh, interesting when people are incorporating their pets in with investigations. You know, to watch watch your pet. You know what? How is your pet reacting? Uh, you know, you had to ask that, or you had to say that. So I got to ask the question because if you ask me, I I don't. I mean, obviously, you know, I have one or two pets in my house. Yeah, just one or two. So, and, and I've watched my pets' reaction, you know. They don't really jump or start barking, you know, at anything. You know, they don't just sit there and then just go off. They don't They do not do that, you know, on a daily basis or Yeah, but great, your, your pets are stupid. I'm talking about intelligent <laughs> animals. <laughs> Do you hear that? You're just called stupid. <laughs> yes, you're a stupid dog. Yes, you are. You're a stupid dog. Yes, you are. Yes, you're so excited to be a stupid dog. Yeah, I can believe that. <laughs> <laughs> just just count, counting her fish. Wouldn't that be funny? Now, there's a new reality show. Investigators bringing their goldfish on investigations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can even think of some people to star on that show. Yeah, oh, well, well. Kiki, it, lick me if you see uh, a giant butthead. <gasps> she just went down. She didn't lick me at all. <laughs> oh, Poor dear doggy. God. <laughs> all right, so I got to, let me ask you another question when it comes okay. back to, to you who has, as far as using uh, be, or becoming a psychic or being a psychic. Do you have passions other than the paranormal and the metaphysical fields, I should say. You know, forget the fact of, of you being you know, as far as a psychic. Do you have other passions out there that you would, you would kind of, I guess, kind of come together, but not really being part of either of, the, of those two fields? What? <laughs> uh, uh. I, the, the thing that I'm probably um i don't know equally or you know uh, up there with um importance in my life is empowering women it's near and dear to my heart i if i could figure out a way and i'm, I'm working on it i feel strongly that um people other women who have kind of made it through situations need to be out talking to those women that are still there you know, it, um, to, to show them the way. Uh, I'm sorry, I had to read chat for a second, but I, I, totally, I totally understand what you're saying because there are women out there that they may be strong women in one sense, but completely lacking because of something that terrible that happened to them. Much, much like in your case, and, I, and I, I don't know if you're, you know, know what I'm kind of referring to, but, you know, when we got together over that one friend of mine who was really a strong woman, she's really strong you know, as far as her personality, she only had one thing that was really 
bothering her. And unfortunately, that was causing her to do strange things when it came to, I guess, uh, being able to, to sleepwalk. Uh, the, I guess not being able to respond well with uh, the other sex when it came to, to certain parts of emotions. Um, and if she would have talked about the dreams that she was having or the things that made her worry way before she came to us, she could have had a, a dramatically change or dramatic change in her life to uh, before then, before she came to us. Well, I mean, I, th I think women in particular, just because that's what I'm, I'm passionate about. I know, I know you guys are out there, and I love you. I love you. I'm telling you I do. But women who have experienced difficult situations need to come to an understanding that they are not their situation. They are, that's not who they are. It's not their makeup. Um, and that, yes, they are affected by it, but it does not change who they intrinsically are. Who their authentic self is, is not that situation. And to move mm -hmm. past that, you know, and I even went to, um, uh, went through this phase where I was calling myself, you know, when I was, and it was a stage I needed to go through, I am the adult, vict or I am an adult survival of sexual abuse. And I wore that like a badge. But what was mm -hmm. that doing? I was just focusing on sexual abuse, sexual abuse, sexual abuse. Just because I stuck in the, the big words of adult survivor, that was now my label. And I needed to move on beyond that and let go of that part of my life. And, you know, everything that was, you know, coming up around it. I don't even know. I think, I think you do know this, but you know, I, was, I was adopted. And I thank God mm -hmm. that I was adopted because that um, helped me through my life and, and sort of detaching from those, the people that raised me. But when I found my birth mother, and I, this is 12, 13 years ago, I found my birth mother. And I was not in the same place that I am now and hired a searcher to find her. And the searcher called me and said, um, I have to tell you that your mother has told me that you are the result of a date rape. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, of course I am. Why would that be any different? That makes perfect sense. I was the result of a date rape. I was raped. You know, blah, blah, blah. This is just my lot in life. And, you know, it's never going to be any better. And look at this albatross hanging over you from even the point of conception. And, right. you know, I just got to the point where, where that, I'm okay with that. It's not who I am. I was not. I am not rape. You know, um, may have been where where I started, but um, it it spurred me. It challenged me. You know, um, it gave me opportunities to to acquire strength and power that I might not have had otherwise. I might not have felt the need to otherwise. Um, I'm I'm self sufficient as a result of it. You know, I've definitely probably got some issues with trust. Maybe every now and then, <laughs> but who doesn't you know, really? yeah. So you know, it. I I want to be able to talk with other women and let them know most most importantly that they are not their situation and that there's always a path to to move forward to not stay stuck. I mean that is that is where so many women are is stuck. Feeling stuck emotionally, feeling stuck physically in their in their place. They're never mm -hmm. life is just never going to get in any better, and it's a self fulfilling prophecy. So, yeah, that that's my passion, women. You know, I've seen some of the conversations that you've had uh, on Facebook and uh, certain groups, stuff like that. Sometimes your conversations have, have gotten quite heated, not really because of something that you had started, but because of something that somebody else had said. Do you think that? Uh, the passion and justice type personality that you have affects sometimes uh, how you you basically respond to somebody or somebody's being uh, basically a, a butthead going up above and beyond and being just a complete well dick i i'm sure because you know yeah i, I love an underdog 
you know, and if somebody's picking on somebody else or just being so in incredibly ridiculous, I, I will fight. You know, I will stand up for what's important and um, I can be quite lengthy <laughs> in my attempts to do that. <laughs> there for a while they were call me blabs instead of babs. So, Ugh. you know, but I, I will I will call somebody to, to task and point out the ridiculousness of it and I'm not afraid to speak up. I'm just not afraid to speak up, obviously. Yeah. I, I can definitely relate to that. Uh, there have been a, a couple occasions where I have said something probably uh, out of the gist of being angry, and uh, you've even, you know, you've given me a call as soon as you heard about it and said, that's totally wrong, Greg. You know that's totally wrong. Think about it. Just, re you know, re draw back, hear what you had said, and is that really the way you want to react? And I'd go, no. So, so... <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of times you've been able to say, well, okay, so what should you do at this point? Well, I guess I should take it back. Yeah, and I would. Uh, only, yeah. only Michelle. I know people, because I, I don't know, I just feel like sometimes I can kind of see beyond you know, and that I think that's where we me mess up the most in our relationships when you know we're arguing or or whatever that we don't look beyond what what is the grand scheme? How important is this related to what it is that we're doing here and we're in a relationship, loving each other, and we say hurtful things and to to poke back. I feel hurt. I'm going to hurt you, and we never think things all the way through. What what is that going to then cause? And the snowball effect of the of the things that we can say to each other. Right. I think you just hit the nail on the head when you said the snowball effect. Because, you know, you, you really do go back and forth. I mean, that's, that's almost human nature in a relationship that, uh, you know, it's like, oh, really? Oh, so you think you're going to take a jab at me? Well, I'm going to take another jab at you. Mine's going to be bigger. Right. You know, I think that's, that's what we do. It's fear. Um, it's just fear. Don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. Please don't hurt me. And so I'm going to protect myself by hurting you. But we right. can't. It's so hard to say that, you know. Geez, when somebody says, you're such an ass. Instead of just saying, you know, golly, that really hurts my feelings. Instead, it's better and cooler and tougher to say, well, if you think I'm an ass, I think you're a, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen, I've seen a few times when uh, somebody has sent you a really nasty email, and it was from someone that you would consider to be a friend of yours. I don't think you consider them a friend anymore. But you would sit there, and instead of, coming right back going oh really you know you actually would go you know what i read your email i'm going to take time and step away from this email and i'll respond to you in in a bit just not right now you know i think anybody else would be like oh really oh no you didn't <laughs> And I'm telling your boyfriend that you got crabs. Because you told me you had crabs and even showed me the medicine that you're taking for him. You know? You, you. I've been known to do that, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have been known to react, for sure. But, you know, I, I, here, here's the deal that I need to try to remind myself more often. But there, there was this time that... I got called into a case. A woman had called me and said, um, I have had a number of investigators here, people who have done um, distance viewing, blah, blah, blah. I have a ghost. I have a demon. I have a Native American spirit. I have an alien. I'm like, okay. Other than that, she seems sane. <laughs> so... So it, it was near her, her home, is near my home, so um, I went and did a walkthrough. And I just wanted to kind of walk through, get, get my feelings, vibe of the place and her uh, before we scheduled an investigation. So I went there, mm -hmm. and it was just weird. And, you know, she talked a lot about all the different situations, and I wasn't sure what I was dealing with. I couldn't get a good um, fix on things. So I came home. And I was going to lay down, and I was still thinking about it, and I said in my mind, 
what the heck is there at her house? And my thought was that I would go to sleep and maybe come up with what it was. So I said, like, what the heck is this in her house? And I lay down, and clearly I heard in my own voice, but not in the way I speak, it said, the question is, what is the answer? The answer is love. Okay? I'm going to say it again because it's confusing. My, I had asked a question, what is there? The reply was, the question is, what is the answer? Okay, so we'll break that down. Don't be concerned about what it is there. All you're looking for is the answer. You know, how do I deal with it? doesn't matter what's okay. there. How do I deal with it? The answer is love. Okay, so, so that that's for everything. Everything. If we can always come from a place of love, our relationships are obviously going to be much better. Our personal relationships are... Um, way that we look at ourselves, our children, our co-workers, whatever. We come at things from a place of love. And, but it also works in, in the paranormal. You know, I had this, this horrible dream that I know was not fully a dream. This was, this was recently. I was actually, it was the um, night before I was driving to see Father Andrew Calder, who um, mm -hmm. we should, everybody knows he's, uh, you know, been in the hospital for a very long time, teetering. Right, um, right going up to see him and I went to sleep that night and actually right before I fell asleep had my eyes open and I saw a black shadow move at the foot of my bed I'm not one to think oh it was a black shadow it must be bad you know it's just a right. lack of light that's all but right. I definitely exactly. saw the shadow so I just went to sleep um, I don't know if this goes with my dream or not just could have been coincidental but I had this dream that this demon thing and I just knew that it was a demon wrapped itself around my entire body it felt like a quilt so it was it was comfortable in a bizarre way um, but I knew it was a demon and it was holding me tight and it was breathing <sighs> right in my ear and I couldn't make out what it was saying but of course I began to get frightened you know and immediately I thought love I have to think love and so I yelled out love and I could, you know, trying to push it out there and feel love for it. And as I felt mm -hmm. that, I started to slip out of its grip. Partway down, my heart rate started again. Fear was taking over and the grip tightened again. And then I d did the same thing, just thought love. And I slipped completely out of its grip and woke up. Wow. So when you say you woke up, it means you, you know, did you actually wake up from a dream state? I, yeah, or yeah, sat, sat straight up. Um, I don't, I don't know. What, what was that? Was it just a complete dream? Did something happen? Was it, you know, a, a spiritual dream showing me that it's an answer? Was there really, de I don't, I don't know. I just know that it was one of those things that felt important. Don't know real, but felt important, significant. When that happened to you, were, you know, while this was occurring to you, did you see your entire environment? Did you see your bedroom? And, you know, could you feel the pillows beneath your head? The, uh, no, because I TV, was upright. You know? in, in the dream, I was upright. He was holding me upright. Yeah, because a lot of people actually have dreams like that. They, they teeter off from, you know, basically being awake, and they drift off to an unconscious sleep. But really, and I kind of tend to think that this is kind of delving into uh, being out of body. Um, I, and I hate to say this because I don't want to scare anybody from trying to practice having out of body. Um, but I, I think that's what's occurring. I think uh, a lot they drift just into that realm of uh, basically being out of body or about to leave their body, and and that's what's what's going on. I, I think so too. I think so too. And <coughs> I don't know what if there was really a demon there or not, but I know that love worked. Love worked against the one thing that might be the most frightening possibility love worked i i think it was you know also uh probably another link to it would say that that's what uh that was your shield and sword that's what you use in you know to go to battle with was was the act of love uh, the having the uh being putting your faith into love 
and uh, that's like what that. empowered you. That's that's how you're able to, you know, you know, like I, like I read that from something. But anyway, to me, I think that's what was what basically occurred. But uh, it's it's now on my clock. It's it's ten twenty seven. Yeah. So we've we've been going on for for quite some time, and it's been a really cool show. Uh, I wish we would have done this a lot sooner, you know, because it was it was fun. It was definitely fun. It was fun. It was it was interesting, and I um, appreciate the chance to kind of talk um, um, more seriously about you know things I think and stuff like that. It was a great chat. I liked it. So uh, you know, was, once again, it was unfortunate that we didn't have Marie on the show, but uh, it turned out that you know, I guess it was kind of a blessing that she wasn't here tonight. But she will. Be on the show uh, in a in a future date, um, maybe by the end of November, maybe early December. But uh, we probably before we log off for the night, talk about our next shows. I uh, guess our next show for next Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel, is going to be the world renowned. Uh, speaking of astral projection, out of body experience, is going to be Robert Bruce. Robert Bruce is uh, has basically he's written several books on the subject of astral projection. He practices astral projection. It, it's his it's his life. That's his life's passion. We will have Robert Bruce on the show. Uh, we'll have him on webcam. We'll have him for everybody to, to ask questions. And I know having Robert on the show is going to be a fun one. That's going to be awesome. I can't wait for that. I can't wait for that. So, yeah, I think that that's going to be good. And sorry, Marie, but there was Michelle D. Griffin tonight instead. <laughs> <laughs> but as Greg said, well, tune... Go ahead. Is your middle initial start with a D? No, it's R. Well, that would have been funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Renee. Renee. <laughs> But definitely tune in next week. Please take some um, time to go over to the throughtheveil.org site. Click on the event. See what's coming up. We've got Panache coming to Atlanta this December um, 9th through 11th. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's, that's going right. to be incredible, incredible, and a must-see thing. If you're you know, in the Atlanta area, know somebody in the Atlanta area, let them know about this and Panache and you know, whatever else we got going. And soon the tickets will be on sale for next June, working on putting that all together in the, on the website as we speak. So big, I got to say, love. before we cast out, everybody, if, if you are in Atlanta, if you're near Atlanta, you have to see Panache. Panache is such a wonderful speaker. And I'm not talking someone who talks about his, his life and, and uh, you know, how he was impoverished how he was poor and he was able to better himself. No, he doesn't speak like that at all. He speaks, he, he come, he's the only person that I can actually say speaks from the heart. And he wants you to speak from the heart as well. That, that's, that's so the best true. Way that I can put it. That's so true. And you feel it listening to him that this is, this is not a speech that he's practiced and, you know, it is from the heart. Exactly. You know. That's why I can't wait till he comes here. I'd love to see him again. I know. We love Panache. We love Panache. And we'll have him on the show, too, soon. Soon. Hopefully. Cool. Cool. You know, uh, anyway, we can talk about that later. Thank you guys for listening. <laughs> Hanging out late with us. 90 minutes tonight. We rocked. We rocked. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. And yeah, we'll see, we will see you next week with, with Robert Bruce. Um, love you, love you, love you. And good night. Good night, everybody.